It has been over 10 years since I first started coding, which is crazy to say. With all that experience does come one major downside, something known as the curse of knowledge. Basically, the further I get into my own coding journey, the harder it is for me to remember and to understand all the challenges associated with learning how to code for the first time. And I used to see this all the time back in college with professors who definitely knew their stuff, but also were so far removed from what it was like to actually learn that material for the first time that they just did not understand why 20 year olds who were learning this for the first time weren't getting it. And I got to have that experience not too long ago, trying to help someone learn how to code for the first time. And it really made me think, what did I learn from that experience that either A, could be helpful to anyone else who's trying to teach someone else how to code, or B, just someone who's going through a lot of those same issues and is struggling to learn the basics of coding and getting started. So these are the five biggest takeaways I had from that experience. So whether you're just learning how to code for the first time, or you're trying to help someone else who's learning how to code, there should hopefully be something for you in here. Point number one, saying it once is not enough. The more experience you get, naturally the more mental models and abstractions you develop. And that means that you can work a lot faster and you can exert a lot less energy on the fundamentals. I'm gonna leave this off with an example because I think it really helps with making this feel more concrete. The analogy I like to use is if someone told me to write the word watermelon, I could do that effortlessly, right? I could do that in my sleep. But if I wanted someone who doesn't know the alphabet to write the word watermelon, they don't have any concept of any of the building blocks of how to even do that. Which means even if I walked someone through how to write all of the shapes and the lines and the strokes to write the word watermelon, one, it would be incredibly taxing, and two, all of those lines would have absolutely no meaning to that person. Which means if I then told them to write the word watermelon again without any help, they might not even know how to start it. This became super clear to me when I started learning Japanese, because unlike when I was learning Spanish and French, when I at least had the building blocks of a consistent alphabet, writing Japanese characters for me was incredibly challenging. I still suck at it. And in this analogy, that's coding, right? If I've written a for loop a million times, I don't need to think about the syntax. I don't need to think about the starting index or the ending index. That's all going to be very automatic. And the nice thing about that is once you've worked with code for long enough, it lets you focus on how to solve the problem and not really so much how to express that in code. But if you've only ever written one for loop or just seen a for loop once before, you're not thinking about how to solve the problem. You were just thinking about what combination of parentheses and braces and semicolons and the three things that you need to stick in between those parentheses to make it work. You know, it could be very confusing because you have all these things that you need to make sure you get just right or the code's just gonna completely blow up and it's not even going to compile. That's why saying it once isn't enough. I've seen people who try to help someone else work through something, they spend five minutes, they talk about all of the steps of the process and all that stuff. And then when the person tries to do it again on their own, they just completely fall on their face and they can't do it. And then it makes it seem like that person just wasn't paying attention or they're just not going to be able to do it. And sure, sometimes that is the case. Sometimes something really is just too challenging for someone or maybe we really aren't just paying enough attention. But in a lot of cases, it really just is that we need repetition, right? We need to try it a couple more times to start building that mental model of, oh, that's actually how those things fit together. And that's how that thing works and to start making some of those mistakes that we can learn from to realize that this thing doesn't work like that that I initially thought, and it actually works more like this. Point number two, let people write bad code. After years of gradually learning how to write cleaner code, it is incredibly tempting to swoop in when you see someone writing code, maybe not the best way, who's a beginner, and to set them back on the path. Because you think you're doing them a service, you are saving them from the pain of building that bad habit of writing sloppy code and teaching them how you wish you had been writing that code in the first place. The issue is, as, as tempting as it is, and I have been there too, what you're really doing is probably just making that person more confused. If you're really still so new to coding that you don't understand all of the basic building blocks and you're still just trying to figure out how to get programs to compile and get it to do what you want it to do, then introducing abstractions is really just going to make things more complicated, even if it is the right way to write the code. Yes, it can definitely be painful to watch someone copy paste the same exact logic 10 times and put it all around their code base. I've seen it, I think we've all seen it, and all you wanna say is just please, please put it in a method and look, and then you can have some parameters, you can reuse that everywhere and look how much cleaner your code is now. And now if you make a mistake in one place, you don't need to copy paste it in all the other places and worry about missing something and having a bug because you forgot to update one of the instances. There's a time and place to explain the concept of reusable code, 
but it's probably not right now, especially if that person is really that new to coding. And it's also worth pointing out that there is a super important aspect of making mistakes organically, right? Anyone who has spent any serious amount of time coding knows that copy pasting logic all around your code base is a recipe for frustration later when you forget to update it in one place because you fixed it somewhere else. And now you have these bugs and you don't know why and you're debugging it because you fixed it in one spot but forgot to update it somewhere else. Once you've had that experience, that is so much more meaningful to you than someone just saying, don't copy paste things around your code base. Because people said that to me early on and I was like, okay, is it really that big of a deal? Once you start making those mistakes and having those experiences, it becomes much more real in your brain of, that's why I don't do that because I got burned by it and now I know don't copy paste things around your code base. So in the meantime, it means that the code will probably be a little worse. There will probably be some more bugs in it. But the last thing you want to do is to overwhelm someone who's new to coding with all this really complicated stuff early on. And also you don't want to rob them of that critical opportunity of making their own mistakes and organically learning how to fix them. Point number three is the exact opposite of point number two, the bad habits that you should correct. Having just talked about all the times when you shouldn't meddle with someone's code to make things more confusing for them, there are some times where I think it does make sense to step in as soon as possible to prevent bad habits from forming. And the main differentiator is just that it's times when it's not going to make anything more confusing. There's a handful of examples where I think this really makes a lot of sense. And one of them is just learning how to name your variables well, or at least naming them descriptively. It doesn't matter if it's someone's first day of learning how to code, telling them not to use variable names i, j, and k is not going to make the code any more confusing, but it will prevent a bad habit from forming that you see in a lot of new devs where they name all of their variable names with things that are just completely meaningless. I think part of the reason why this ends up being a problem is because a lot of new devs are writing toy programs that one, are so small that there are never going to be that many variables, so it's not that hard to keep track of what i, j, and k actually mean, and two, you're gonna spend 30 minutes writing it and then you're gonna shelve it to work on something else and you're never going to have to read that code again. It's not until you get much further into coding that you have to start thinking about things like maintainability and collaboration, where you actually need to write code that's going to make sense when you come back to it later, or if someone who isn't you is going to actually have to walk through that code. Or you just start working on bigger and bigger programs to the point where you have more and more variables for every letter of the alphabet, and there is just no way you're going to mentally keep track of what all of those actually mean. Another example is formatting, especially with auto formatting matters, this is such an easy one, but a lot of new people, especially in languages where it doesn't really matter what the white space is, will have tabbing that's just completely inconsistent and all over the place. They'll have braces and parentheses kind of all over the place with no consistency, and readability just sucks. Once again, absolutely no extra effort required to fix your formatting, doesn't add any complexity, and if anyone else is ever trying to read your code to help you debug it or explain something to you, it will be much appreciated. So in summary, it's a pretty simple distinction. If it's gonna add more complexity and confusion, especially if you're working with a really new dev, consider keeping that advice to yourself, at least for now. But if you don't think it's gonna add any more complexity, then yeah, it makes sense to address it now and not let that bad habit form and the need to put in all the extra effort later to break that bad habit. Point number four is about the value of guessing. Generally speaking, making quasi-random changes to your code and running it over and over again to see if it fixes your problem or works is not the best technique for developing quality software. I'm also going to go out on a limb and assume that 99% of people watching this video are guilty of having done this at some point, myself included. The guessing that I'm talking about here might feel a little bit different because generally it's for things that are pretty trivial once you actually know how to code versus something that's really out there or random or just poorly documented. But fundamentally, it's the same idea, right? Someone doesn't understand what to do and how to make something work, and they're just gonna make random changes and kind of poke and prod at something until it does do what they want it to do. Because early on, there's so much that you don't know and so much that you're trying to figure out all at once Sometimes you don't even know what you're confused about. It's not just that you need to do a quick search for how to do XYZ because you don't know what XYZ is. You might not even know that XYZ exists. You might not have learned about that concept yet in coding. So you just know that you're having a problem and you're using the limited number of tools in your tool set to try to figure it out. The mistake that I like to reference from when I first started coding, that's pretty embarrassing, is the first time I ever saw a conditional use that just was a variable name. So if my var, and it wasn't if my var equals equals true or equals equals false. 
And I saw this one time and I was trying to write my own code and I effectively tried to pattern match against what I had seen before, but didn't quite remember it. And instead of writing, you know, if my var, I wrote if true. And I had defined my Boolean on the previous line and I thought through some sort of compiler magic or something, it was going to take the variable I had defined on the previous line and evaluate that against the true condition. Um, obviously that was never going to work. Um, and it feels a little bit silly to think that I thought that was going to work. But in the moment, I didn't really know, right? I had seen something that looked kind of like that before, and I was just experimenting and playing around. And because I was expecting that Boolean to have a true value, then it seemed like my code actually worked, even though it was completely not doing what it was supposed to be doing. All this to say, guessing or experimenting is a natural part of learning how to code. Once you know how to code, it's really easy to see someone who is stumbling through something and to wonder what the heck they're doing and just immediately want to put them back on the path and sometimes it does make sense to set someone straight, but we also should keep in mind that it's really important to go through that experimentation and that you can learn a ton from making the mistakes and figuring out how something actually really works by just playing around with it instead of someone always telling you exactly how something is or is not supposed to work. The last point I wanna talk about is the importance of striking the right balance between having fun and making sure you're still learning all of the fundamentals. If your approach to learning how to code for the first time is to sit down and crack Strauss-Strep's the C++ programming language and just to read that from cover to cover without meaning any offense to that book or any other book, it is going to be really hard to get you to stay with programming probably unless you are really bought into it. On the other hand, if you do something that's heavily gamified or just really design centric, it might be a ton of fun and it might be very creatively stimulating but you might not really be learning enough depending on what that is, and you might end up with really huge gaps in your foundation. I'm not gonna pretend like there is a one size fits all answer to this question. I think it really depends on your interests, your motivations, your learning style. You know, what's going to keep you invested and progressing with your learning is different than for a lot of other people. I will say it's very easy to fall into the trap of focusing too much on the fun side and leaning too far in that direction. You learn just enough of the basics to be able to do what you want to do and enjoy the fun stuff without really focusing on building the foundation and really learning those fundamentals. Sometimes the fun thing will grow with you organically, which is great when that happens. So you will keep learning more and more to be able to keep doing whatever that fun thing is that you're doing. You see this a lot with people's passion projects where they start with something that's pretty simple and basic, but every time they wanna add some new functionality, that then compels them to learn how to do something new. I think in most cases though, the best solution is going to be to strike that balance between the games or the mini projects and some level of structured learning. For example, maybe you're making a personal website as your fun, creative outlet, but you're also doing something like an online course. So you get something that's structured, you're learning a lot of the fundamentals, but then you can take all that stuff and apply it to that fun thing that you're doing and make your personal website even better. Ultimately, it's pretty simple. If you find that you're not really advancing, maybe focus a little bit less on the fun, and a little bit more on structured learning. And if you feel like you're burning out, assuming that you want to keep going, then maybe back off a little bit on the books or the courses that are really hardcore and not really that fun and find some ways to make what you're doing a little bit more fun. Just paying attention to your enthusiasm and your progression is going to be the best way to measure this and no one is going to know that any better than you. All right, hopefully some of those points end up being helpful. If you'd like to see a part two, just let me know. And if you haven't already, consider subscribing if you enjoyed this video. I definitely appreciate it. Anyways, that's it. Thanks so much for watching and I will catch you guys in the next one.